Thank you so much for that, Laura. That's, I think that was really great to see that, you know, as we are entering the stage where, you know, uh, invest in investing in, in, you know, sustainable technologies and sustainable in sustainable business is not just sort of the responsible and right thing to do, but actually makes business sense. Yes. I think it's fantastic to, to see how on the ground that actually the promotion, that shifting, as you say, of, yep. of, of uh, the finance works and how that's promoted here in Ireland. Um, uh, we've just some time for some questions from the floor. Uh, anyone wants to kick us off? Yes. Uh, if you would just state your name and uh, we can... Uh, yes. Thanks very much. <laughs> um, Colin Bergen with Bank of Ireland. Uh, Laura, thanks very much. Really, really interesting. I went to one of the Sustainable Nation events last week as well. And it was like as in, they're all really, they're like as in really future focused, really, really interesting to listen to. Um, I suppose my question is around the area of responsible investment. And I suppose there's kind of two broad strategies around it. It's divestment or kind of activism. And uh, just wondering from your own experience, uh, which one would you recommend? And then which one do you think is more popular or which one do you think is getting, yeah. getting more traction? Um, I, I don't think I've quite made up my mind on the question as yet. Um, like the argument against divestment is that who's going to buy the shares and who's going to be left with the problems? You know, there's always someone else who'll buy the shares and maybe they're, you know, what, it, you know, what, what will happen? You're not actually getting anyone to change anything. Um, you're just selling out of the stock and, you know, causing things to collapse, basically, and values to collapse. Um, and the activism point that I think you're referring to is like instead of engaging with the company, so like the way people are engaging with Shell, they're engaging with all the oil companies now and forcing them to, well, basically, you know, forcing them to, uh, to look at their business model and figure out, okay, does this business model work in a two degree scenario uh, or a three degree scenario or a four degree scenario? And that is what the task force and climate related disclosures is all about, doing that risk analysis. And then seeing how you need to change your business model and I suppose yeah I kind of hadn't decided what way I, what one I'm coming down at but like I am about jobs I think jobs are really important for, you know for people for their values for everything um, and like do we want to see all these big huge oil companies completely going bust or you know and all jobs being lost and value being lost people losing their pensions because they're invested in them etc I think I prefer them to change to a different business model put their money instead into um, into renewables or into something that's more climate aligned. It doesn't always have to be renewables, they can do something else. Um, but, and putting their money into innovation and, you know, like dealing with the reality. So I think now that you asked me, I think I probably am coming down on the side of engagement, shareholder engagement. And it's brilliant to see the, the investment managers, like is the, the institutional, um, the invest the investment asset managers like BlackRock, like these big guys, they can really move things because they have trillions of assets under management and they have big stakes built up in all these companies that they're holding on behalf of their ultimate investors. So BlackRock, I think they have five trillion of assets under management. If they make a decision to engage, um, they have such you know big stakes that in the, in the companies, then they can really force change through. And I think that probably is the way to go to kind of try and engage and just change the way business is done. Um, and I think most, you know, there is always a uh, reticence to change, you know, <coughs> reluctance to change, and I think it does need to be forced most of the time. So I think I'm coming down on side engagement, activism. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, Kia McCarthy, I work here at the IEA. Um, just two, two short questions, one kind of on the big macro side and then one on the micro side. So, the slide you had, the slide you had with all the, the twenty different yeah. uh, interactions. Is there much of a, I guess, a network effect or a knock-on effect between those institutions? So when, for example, if a sovereign wealth fund invests in something, that's going to attract more private investment through bonds yeah. and vice versa. And if there is, who are the real leaders? Where are the are the sovereign wealth funds following the financial institutions? Is it the other way around? And is it is there kind of a government role in in saying? Yeah. Green finance is important. We're going to invest yeah. in it, and you should follow us. Or yeah. how does that work? Yeah. And then on the much smaller level, say, how does it work for individuals? Say you're somebody with a very modest, you know, you, you want to have yeah. your own little um, yeah. investments, and you've, you want to diversify, and you have a few grand, maybe 10, 20 grand yeah. that you want to invest. Is there an avenue there for you to get involved in green finance, or you just yeah. kind of have to trust that you know your portfolio managers are going to do it for you? Yeah. Okay. 
Um, on the macro one, the sovereign wealth ones are hugely important to this, and they are the ones that are really um, that really are starting to move the market, um, or starting to move the, the debate, um, and they're really important because they they by definition have a long term focus, um, and they are seeing you know they're investing for fifty years, not for two, you know, and they want to see their returns, and I think that's. That's, they are going to be the leaders and they, they are already leading um, in that way and I think it's really important that they do so and if you look at our own sovereign wealth fund, the ISIF, so they are, they were original signatories of the responsible, principles of responsible investment, they are, they are just thought leaders in responsible investment in Ireland um, and they are starting to have influence on the other asset owners in Ireland who are mainly the, the large pension funds. Um, so I do think the sovereign funds are vital, um, <coughs> but that's where policy comes in. Because if you look at the other guys, right, so banking, debt and equity markets, insurance, investment, the, nearly the problem with everyone else is that they have a shorter, short-term focus. So they, and they, they're not, you know, the way they, they might want to turn their money or they might only be able to invest it for three years or, you know, as people, they might only want to do that. But as well as institutions, they're all subject to regulation about what they can and can't do with their money. These are all highly regulated. Um, sectors. Um, so policy is going to be key there and trying to move them from having a short term focus, maximising returns in the short term, in which case you might be happy to, to invest in something more volatile or taking a, a longer term view and putting your money to work for 15 years in a wind farm and taking a, a, a lower return than otherwise but a more secure return. So, you know, arguably a, a better risk adjusted return. But you do have to move that debate from short-termism to long-termism, which is what all of those, um, all of the policy initiatives that I discussed earlier that are coming out, that's what they're all trying to do. And the EU action plan on sustainable finance really focuses on that. And I think we're going to see more and more um, regulation and legislation coming down from the EU in particular um, to try and shift that focus so that people do make long-term decisions. Um, rather than just focusing on short-term returns. Um, in relation to all your own personal bundles of wealth, obviously. Um, yeah, no, I do think that's an issue. Like, and and I, we have had calls into the office. I want to invest, I want my pension invested in something that's sustainable, like something that's making a difference, even in a small way. And that's where I think we need to push banks to offer retail products that are, um, you know, have a suite of products. So you can invest in XYZ or else you can invest in this green one that, and you know, the, your risks and your returns are explained and you make your choice then. Um, like the, the idea that uh, investing responsibility, in, responsibly means negative, you know, lower returns is moving away. The, often the issue is that there is a confusion between ethical investment and responsible investment. Um, so what we're not talking about responsible investment, uh, ethical investment anymore. Responsible investment is simply about taking all factors. So you're not just looking at the financial historical performance and the expected financial future performance of a company that they tell you, you're looking outside of that. What are the environmental factors that's going to hit this company? What's their supply chain look like? Have they got factories somewhere, you know, with poor labour conditions? Um, and you're taking all those other factors into account when you're investing. So there are increasing numbers of retail products out there. Uh, there is a question about greenwashing and all that kind of stuff. But I think, I think we you know, Ireland especially, I think they're more advanced in, in Europe, we need to start pushing our banks and our, our uh, product providers that we want, you know, these type of options, either climate aligned ones, pure environmentally sustainable themed investment options, or else, um, or else, you know, responsible investment or ESG type funds and options. Um, yeah, I think people power might be needed a bit. Yeah, Brian Denver from SEAI. Um, thanks, Laurie, for a very inspiring uh, presentation. And I'm convinced now that Ireland is the global leader in green finance. It is! <laughs> um, my question is about sort of post subsidy world for renewables or, yeah. for want of a better phrase, less generous subsidy yeah. phase. Um, so, electricity aside, yeah. um, most of the wind farms and the renewable projects in Ireland uh, were built in part because they give investors very reliable yeah. source of revenue and secure, very low risk. Yeah. And we're moving beyond that across Europe. 
And I'm just interested to get your view on um, how capital markets are feeling about that, how investors are feeling about a less generous return. Yep. So, you know, more competitive options, yep. more market measures to, to support renewables. Yep. Um, have we seen a boom and now it's going to flatline, or is investment in renewable electricity going to continue? I, I think you have to compare it to the other options. So I'm, I'm not an expert on this area, but so if institutional investors are looking for investment opportunities, um, even without their like projects, you know, on, in, in Europe and in Germany, I think there's an offshore wind project that doesn't need a subsidy now that won an auction. Um, so there is, you know, projects are moving to be non-subsidized and that's because the capex of the solar kit and the capex of the wind, wind uh, kit is coming down. Um, and I think investors are savvy enough now, like your Black Rocks and your Brookfields and all these guys, they're savvy enough now. They know, you know, the data they have is better in terms of the future, you know, wind resource or solar resource. They can model this all out and they'll make their decisions based on the risk adjuster return and compare it to where they could put their money to work otherwise. So if they're comparing it to putting it on deposit, obviously, even if it's lower returns, but improved as against that they might be able to take a bit more risk you know the way I think it's stacking it up against what are their other options um but I do think like if if the uh if if the returns aren't there that the projects just won't get built without the subsidies like they people will only like they'll be smart they'll only put their money in if there is no you know if the returns are there full stop um so I I, I do think subsidies will go away once the returns are there anyway I think they should. Like. So please. Hi, sorry, uh, David Berkeley, Bank of Ireland. Just to pick up on that, um, I mean, obviously, there's still huge opportunities. Like, yeah. you know, Eddie O'Connor is a genius. Air yeah. Electricity is great. Yeah. In developing <laughs> countries, the first 10 or 20% of yeah. renewables you put on the grid is really easy to do. Yeah. But there, there's starting to be more and more problems. You look yeah. at European energy markets with negative energy prices. Yeah. And there's a lot of issues that come with that. Yeah. And there's still a huge amount of, sort of implicit subsidies in the yeah. way renewables are treated, that you know, they're constrained on, so they yeah. don't have to compete, and they don't pro provide certain things like system services. Yeah. And is there not a danger that as those implicit subsidies become explicit, they're, you know, and they might be changed at some point retroactively, mm. that you could be putting sort of investors up to, to serious harm because the, a, a lot of them are still relying on those implicit subsidies that they get to run mm. anytime they want. Mm. Um, and those costs are starting to become apparent in places like Germany, and you're yeah. seeing a lot of opposition yeah. too. So there's still huge opportunities outside, you know, developed tw yeah. world where it's 20 30%, yeah. but it's, it looks like it might plateau where the opposition is yeah. going to grow because the and, less cost. And the only thing I'd say there is like, I do believe in policy certainty. You know, I'm not, like I'm not an expert on renewable energy systems and all that, but I do think like if you're an investor and you're putting your money in for a 15 year period or a seven year period or whatever it is, you're making your decision on a certain date on the basis of, uh, what, as, as you know, you're making your assessment of the facts. And to the extent things are guaranteed under legislation and a government is asking an investor to put their money in, this is my view, right? Yeah. I think like, you know the way you shouldn't you shouldn't then be making retroactive changes make them going forward yeah. and then people who are coming in at this point can decide okay i put my money in back then because i was happy with x percent and now if i put my money in here well i'm looking at a different profile and it's going to be much reduced and i'm not as happy with that that's fine they won't come in again but if you if you have retroactive changes it'll impact the people who put their money in back here and they'll definitely never come in again. You know the way, give people a choice. And I think, the, like, I know things are changing the whole time and CapEx prices are coming down for the, the actual kit and, you know, all that. But I do think investors make their decisions and they take a risk, you know, at the time on multiple different things. I don't think they should be having to take a risk on policy stability or retroactive change. That's just my own view. Any further? And I, I and I don't know a huge amount of it about it, but like there are implicit subsidies for fossil fuels as well. They always talk about it. Yeah. Um, so when are we going to price them in? True, but I, I think you know a lot of the yeah. implicit ones. That, I mean, I'm a huge supporter of green energy, but yeah. you know some of them. Um, it's only when you get to a higher level of renewable that it becomes 
becomes clear. It becomes a bigger issue. Yeah. 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 No, it is a tricky one. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks. Uh, can I actually ask a question? <laughs> I'm just sort of uh, just interested in how it sort of works on the ground for in yeah. in say if, if, um, first nationally in Ireland. How is your communication with uh, government working? Do you have structured channels with? Uh, Department of Finance, Department of Communications, Climate Action and Environment. I think, it, um, like, everyone is, like, Green mm. and Sustainable Finance is new. Like, like I said, you know, the way I didn't even know I was working in it. Like, it's only well-defined in the past two years, but now it's really well-defined. Um, but national, national countries are, you know, trying to keep up with the pace of change. You know, the way, so we're, I feel like Ireland as a whole, private sector and public, mm -hmm. are on a bit of a journey. Oh, this is green and sustainable finance, right. And it's the same journey other countries are on. So I do think, like, a, a, we all need to go on a bit of journey together. Um, and I do think a good opportunity for the private sector to hear what government are thinking and vice versa is in public-private forums, you know, the way such as the Finance Green Ireland mm -hmm. um, initiative. So that both are hearing, you know, the sides. And yeah. I do think half the battle with green finance is explaining what it is. You know, the way I often find myself explaining to taxi drivers what it is. And they go, oh, yeah, I know what it means. Oh, I know what you mean now. You know the way. Um, and part of it is, I think, like, just like I say, the work I do is I work with both the public sector and the private sector to raise awareness of the opportunity that is green finance. Mm -hmm. And I, I think the, uh, you know, as anyone we've come, we do work with the Department of Finance, they will have said publicly that they would regard Sustainable Nation as a bridge. So a bridge between public and private. Yes. And I, I, I'm really, com you know, I think that's a great way of describing it because I think everyone needs to be on the same page mm -hmm. facing forward, selling Ireland. That's great. <laughs> uh, I think I, I, on that point, just I'm, I'm wondering, you said there's about 20 sort of green financial yep. services centres now globally out of, out of about 100. Is there any sort of communication or, or happening among those, sort yes. of sharing about of best practice and, yes. and what have you? If I so uh, the UN has set up um, centres, <coughs> a network of centres, financial centres for sustainability. Um, sustainable Nation uh, joined that uh, last September. The first, so this is, it's all new. So the first meeting of that was in Casablanca last September. Mm -hmm. The inaugural meeting was in Italy about two weeks ago. Stephen Nolan went over to it, our CEO. And um, so there is a lot happening. And it's like I said, it's usually financial centres compete and they say, I'm doing this and I'm doing that. But like in this sector, it's so broad, it affects everything and everyone has their own little speciality. So Luxembourg is amazing at green bonds. They're amazing at that. But they were actually in the right place at the right time. So the World Bank and the EIB were the first ones to list green bonds 10 years ago. They list them in Luxembourg, that's where they always list. Luxembourg saw this as a growth area, they've gone for it, they have a green exchange now, a full green exchange for stocks and shares and debt. Um, so Luxembourg are really good at that. I think Ireland, we're kind of brilliant at international financial services and therefore we can be brilliant at green international financial services, but I think our real talent is that renewable energy finance talent cluster. And by the way, we're also brilliant at forestry funds <laughs> and we've a good few of them in our network. And um, London is, uh, amazing for equities but they don't really do bonds they do they uh, you do bonds but not as much as we do um, uh, London is great for indices great for analysis France is amazing on loads of different levels but not particularly bonds but they're amazing at thought leadership at, um, at again at data analysis uh, you know ESG data providers and thought leaders and stuff they're amazing at and the whole country is behind sustainable finance there it's amazing what Macron has done um, Germany has Frankfurt is, has a, a centre and they are brilliant at um, they have loads of like UN bodies and kind of headquarters mm -hmm. there and they're kind of making a lot out of that so I think each different financial centre is little USP its own but everyone's recognising that you don't nearly need of course we're competing but you nearly don't need to because the opportunity is so huge let's just all go for it and you know, sell what we can do, and then hopefully we'll make a bit of a change. That's really interesting. I, I suppose on yeah. that note, unless we have any any last minute, uh, sure. Yes. Yeah, it's actually you're just not prompted at, at, at all. Because yeah. everybody wants to go for it. I mean, yeah. there's there um, there might be a lot of stranded assets then as well. Yeah. And how how has that been quantified? How much that could of a challenge that could be? I think there's loads of different numbers on it, aren't there? So the stranded assets being, I suppose, the 
the fossil fuel reserves you can't take out of the the ground if we want to stay within two degrees the unburnable fossil fuels basically um, and any companies that depend on those um, or own those reserves or are in the value chain that will drive their value from those where it will be in, stru- will in trouble um, I think a number you know of different numbers have been put on it um, and that's like that's why the, the whole thing about companies disclosing their climate related financial risks is so important this is the TCFD um, and this is why we're, this is Mark Carney. So Mark Carney is the governor of the Bank of England. He's the head of the Financial Stability Board that was set up after the crash, uh, the global one. And he sees climate change as a huge risk for the global financial system. Again, he is looking at it really dispassionately. He's looking at the numbers and he's saying, there's going to be stranded asset risk. There's going to be this, that and the other. And all he says is that companies need to disclose the information so investors can make their decision and the market can adjust over time. Because if climate change is happening, um, it'll be too late nearly for the financial system. There will be another crisis and another systemic, systemic risk from it, from stranded ass- asset issues, etc. So he really sees that and that's why I think the task force and climate related disclosures is so important so that there is a gradual adjustment rather than just we go off a cliff we say, okay, we cannot touch those fossil fuel reserves from this date, and then, you know, the whole financial system could potentially be in trouble. And he sees that, and that is being increasingly recognised, and that's why I think the TCFD is so important. Um, so I, I, I will await the outcome of that. Well, that's the progress. <laughs> uh, I suppose I'd, on that note, we can bring the Q and A to a close. And uh, before we finish up. Uh, just to, I just wanted to thank you for, for coming, and uh, it's, it's fantastic to see people, uh, you know, coming to these events, uh, networking, and finding out about such a variety of topics. And I think tonight's talk was particularly excellent. Uh, do stick around for uh, some one more drink, uh, <laughs> a few more. There's plenty of refreshments, uh, and uh, networking Am I to be even done. Though I'm over 35. Of, of course, yeah. <laughs> uh, except, I won't how much I think, over I am. <laughs> I think we can make an <laughs> Uh, and uh, we hope to see you again for uh, our next event, which will be on the 24th of May, right? Yes, which will be with Ronan Tynan, who's going to talk about the movie Syria, The Impossible Revolution. So that should be quite interesting as well. Uh, I, I suppose we'll be emailing out more information and be uh, disseminated through our social media channels and, and uh, uh, the like as well. Um, and in, uh, finally, may I just on your behalf uh, thank Laura for, I think, what, what, what was quite a, quite a heartening presentation, actually, because <laughs> it, you know, saying that climate change mitigation doesn't have to mean austerity, it doesn't yeah. have to mean the, ha- the hair shirt, as it were. Yeah. It just, it can, if we can shift those financial flows and if we can uh, catalyze that finance, it can actually be this tremendous opportunity for, for growth and prosperity. So. Uh, thank you, and I wish you the best of success, and hope to see you again at the Institute. Thank you very much. Thanks,